There are many reasons that history can be forgotten. Sometimes events are simply overshadowed by larger events. Sometimes it's just the passage of time. The witnesses pass away and society moves on. Sometimes records, when they're kept, are destroyed by accident or by design. Sometimes history is even deliberately wiped away for political purposes. And sometimes events simply are not recorded from the very start. 88 years ago, 337 men of the Royal Navy died in an accident involving one of the most famous ships in the world, and owing to wartime exigency, their deaths went unreported. And yet, the men of HMS Kurosawa deserve to be remembered. The light armored cruisers of the Royal Navy's C-Class were initially ordered in 1913. Eventually, 28 vessels were commissioned between 1915 and 1922. The cruisers of the C-Class were designed to operate in the rough waters of the North Sea and were generally considered to be a successful class. HMS Curaçao, named to commemorate the British capture of the Dutch island of Curaçao during the Napoleonic Wars, was one of five cruisers of the Ceres subclass. Laid down in July 1916, she was launched in May 1917 and commissioned in February 1918. 450 foot 3 inches long, she displaced 4,190 long tons. Launched in the last year of the war, she saw limited service in the Baltic, supporting the British intervention in the Russian Civil War. During the interwar years, many ships of the C-Class were decommissioned in light of the limitations of various naval treaties. In fact, the class may have been decommissioned altogether, were it not for the new challenge facing naval planners, naval aviation. The blog site Dinger's Aviation Pages explains Royal Navy thinking regarding anti-aircraft defenses in the 1920s and 30s. The increasing speed of aircraft meant that there was less time from first observing an approaching force of enemy aircraft to them attacking. To have the carriers break off from the main fleet and steam a straight course into the wind to launch their fighters would make them easy targets for both torpedo bombers and level bombers. So the Navy decided that close-in defense of their fleet should be done by anti-aircraft fire alone. They decided to convert many of their existing light cruisers into anti-aircraft cruisers, equipped with these new weapons. Curaçao began her conversion in July 1939, just before the outbreak of war. Her main guns and torpedo tubes were removed and replaced with an array of anti-aircraft weapons, although the changes required the addition of ballast to keep the ship stable at sea. As modified, she now displaced 5,403 long tons, at a top speed of approximately 25 knots and a crew complement of 439. She served in the Norwegian campaign, where she was damaged by a German aerial bomb, before being transferred to the Western Approaches Command, where she participated in convoy defense, operating first from Rosyth, Scotland, and then from Belfast, Northern Ireland. Although an older vessel, she was an experienced escort. Between September of 1940 and October of 1942, HMS Curaçao escorted more than 80 Atlantic convoys through British home waters. On October 1, 1942, under the command of Captain John Boutwood, she was assigned, along with the destroyer HMS Bulldog, to join and assist the destroyers HMS Branham, Cowdery and Skate, and Polish destroyer Bluskowiska in escorting convoy AT-024 during its final stage of passage to Clyde Northwest Approaches. Historian Daniel Allen Butler wrote of Boutwood in his 2004 book The Age of Cunard. A career officer who had joined the Royal Navy in 1917, while no single command had marked him as an exceptional officer, that he was more than simply competent was demonstrated by his promotion to captain in early 1942, a rank not lightly bestowed in peacetime or in war. The convoy consisted of a single and very famous ship that was carrying American troops to war. The Cunard Line began construction of an unnamed ship on December 17, 1930. It was the age of transatlantic liner travel, and the new ship was specifically designed as a response to the growing size and luxury of liner designs. The work was abandoned in the face of the Great Depression, only resumed when the line received a government grant. The 1,019-foot-long, more than 80,000 gross registered ton ship was launched on April 3, 1934. At the launching ceremony, she was given the name RMS, or Royal Mail Ship, Queen Mary, named after Mary of Tech, consort of King George V. The ship was so large that a portion of the River Clyde had to be widened and deepened to accommodate her. Intended for weekly service between the UK and New York, she was a fast vessel, capable of making more than 32 knots. She captured the Blue Ribbon for the fastest Atlantic crossing in August 1936. The website Legends of America explains that, for three years, the luxury ocean liner hosted the world's rich and famous across the Atlantic, including the likes of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, Greta Garbo, Clark Gable, David Niven, Mary Pickford, George and Ira Gershwin, and Sir Winston Churchill, to name a few. 
but the great liner was about to undertake a different role. In 1939, war threatened. Naval historian Daniel Allen Butler wrote in his 2002 book, Warrior Queens. The Queen Mary was put to sea from Southampton, bound for New York on August 30, 1939, carrying a record number of 2,332 passengers, including Mr. and Mrs. Bob Hope, and carrying a cargo of $44 million in gold bullion. Most of the passengers were American, as U.S. citizens were leaving the continent in droves that August. It was clear that more than just a crisis was looming, and no one wanted to be caught on the wrong side of the Atlantic if the shooting started. It seemed more and more likely every day. Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, followed by an ultimatum by the United Kingdom and France and then a formal declaration of war on September 3rd. Queen Mary steamed into New York Harbor on September 5th. Further services were canceled. Queen Mary remained in New York under the protection of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the New York Police Department for fear of German saboteurs. Realizing the value of the liner as a troop ship, in March 1940, the Admiralty informed Cunard that their ships would be requisitioned for service. Queen Mary was sent to Australia to be refitted as a troop ship. The newspaper The Guilford Dragon explained in 2021 the luxurious fittings, including stateroom furniture and the fine decoration, had been removed and stored to be replaced by triple-tiered wooden bunks. Anti-mine protection was applied to the hull, and the grand cruising black, white, and red colors of her hull and funnels were painted over in Royal Navy Gray. The ship offered specific value as a troop ship. The Dragon continues. Apart from size, the ship was ideal for transporting troops safely because of its speed of more than 32 knots, which meant that she could outrun the lethal Nazi U-boats. Soon, the Queen Mary became known as the Grey Ghost. On May 5th, Queen Mary set sail from Sydney, bound for Scotland, carrying 5,000 Australian soldiers. The ship and soldiers arrived safely on June 16th, although their presence was kept secret. Japan's entry into the war in December 1941 meant that the Queen Mary was moved from the Indian Ocean and the threat of Japanese attack back to the Atlantic, where she would be used to carry the troops of the new ally, the United States. Queen Mary was again refitted, this time allowing her to carry 15,000 troops. So many of the Cunard men worried that, carrying a full load, the ship would barely clear the Holland Tunnel in New York Harbor. The ship was also outfitted with armament equivalent to that of a light cruiser, which Butler notes, though certainly not meant to allow the Queen to slug it out with a conventional warship larger than a destroyer, it was an armament heavy enough to discourage any raider or surface U-boat that might mistakenly want to pick a fight. Queen Mary's primary role was to carry American troops across the Atlantic to the United Kingdom, building up the force that would be used to invade Fortress Europe, often making the return trip loaded with POWs destined for the United States and Canada. The crossing was always dangerous, but even more so for Queen Mary and her sister ship Queen Elizabeth, whose role was recognized as vital by both the Allies and the Axis. Butler writes that not long after the two liners began ferrying troops across the Atlantic, Adolf Hitler offered a reward of a million Reichmarks, the equivalent of $250,000, to the U-boat skipper who sank either of them. Usually, Queen Mary would make much of the trip unescorted, using her speed to evade U-boats. Travel times and routes were kept secret. Even the captain would have little advance warning of departure times, and routes were only revealed by a sealed envelope after the ship put to sea. While her speed was a good defense against the U-boats, there was always a risk of a U-boat lying in wait. So when Queen Mary traveled, she followed a zigzag pattern, preventing the ship from staying on a single bearing long enough for a submarine to target it. While they might be able to keep the Atlantic route secret, there was a particular risk, however, as they were entering or leaving port. Butler explains that this was due to largely to their size. There was only one port in the United States that could handle them, New York, and with Southampton within range of half the Luftwaffe, the only port left to them was Gorok on the Clyde in Scotland, just below Glasgow. Because of the risk, the ship would be escorted by U.S. destroyers within 150 miles of New York, and met by a Royal Navy escort as they approached the Irish coast. But both navies were stretched thin. There was especially a lack of cruisers available for escort. Butler writes that while destroyers were the backbone of the anti-submarine defense, cruisers were the key to anti-aircraft protection. The problem is there were not enough modern cruisers to go around. And that is why aged vessels like HMS Kurosawa were still being used, even though Butler notes no amount of modification could make up for the fact that many C-class cruisers were 25 years old and showing their age. But he writes, the anti-aircraft cruisers were crucial for protection of the Queen, especially in 1942, because neither the Queens had much anti-aircraft armament of their own mounted at the time, and German patrol planes and bombers were taking a heavy toll of shipping in the waters around Great Britain. Convoy 024 left New York on September 27, 1942, carrying approximately 10,000 troops of the U.S. 29th Infantry Division. 
Butler notes that the man on the bridge of the Queen Mary was Captain Giles Gordon Illingworth, who was respected within the company as being a conscientious and careful officer, qualities Cunard always placed a high value on. It's difficult to seriously question Illingworth's competence as a captain, since Cunard had entrusted him with the pride of their fleet. In his 1989 book, Beyond the Beachhead, historian Joseph Balkowski noted the difficulty faced by these troops as they crossed the Atlantic. At first, the zigzagging drove the 29ers mad. Sharp course changes at 28 knots heeled the ship over, slid dishes off of tables, and tumbled men out of their cots. If somebody fell overboard, they would be out of luck. The 29ers were told to wear their life preservers at all times, but the risk was too great to allow a ship in the middle of U-boat-infested waters to mount a rescue operation. The crossing was harrowing, and Butler notes what every GI aboard looked forward to, and every sailor as well, was to rendezvous with the British escorts. That occurred for the men of the 29th and October 2nd. Malkowski tells what the men of the 29th saw. When Queen Mary was 160 miles from her destination, she was met off the northern Irish coast by a Royal Navy flotilla. The flotilla consisted of six destroyers and a single cruiser, HMS Curacao. Each of the destroyers took station two or three miles distant from Mary, forming an anti-submarine screen around the liner. Curacao was supposed to provide protection against enemy air attacks, so she assumed a position as close by as possible to Mary. Alfred Johnson, a 22-year-old merchant mariner aboard Queen Mary that day, was quoted by the BBC in 2004. There were two of us on the poop deck on the aft of the ship, and we were manning the six-inch gun in case we came under attack. What good we could have done with one gun, I have no idea. A cruiser called HMS Curacao met us 200 miles off the coast to escort us into Greenock. I could see her clearly as I was on the aft. Balkowski writes that the 29ers watched the British warship with interest, for they were the first sign of life beyond Mary the men had seen for six days. They took particular interest in the sleek Curacao, which dashed from one side of Mary to another like an undisciplined puppy, hovering around its new master. Butler explains that it was just 10 o'clock that morning when the cruiser took up a position roughly five miles ahead of the huge liner, and the two ships wove back and forth in an intricate pattern of zigzags, designed to distract and discomfort any U-boat to commander trying to line up an approach to get a torpedo off at the Mary. Almost immediately, a series of incidents and circumstances, unnoticed at the time but glaringly obvious in hindsight, began to fall into place. While neither ship seemed to have noticed the problem yet, it was becoming obvious to observers. Johnson recalled we could see our escort zigzagging in front of us. It was common for the ships and cruisers to zigzag to confuse the U-boats, but in this particular case, however, the escort was very, very close to us. I said to my mate, You know, she's zigzagging all over the place in front of us. I'm sure we're going to hit her. Valkoski explained maneuvers in close proximity to a giant ocean liner were tricky even under the best conditions. When both the liner and its escorts were zigzagging violently, these maneuvers were downright dangerous. Around noon, Curacao unexpectedly crossed across Mary's bow, and the two ships missed each other by only a few hundred yards. Some 29ers even began to take bets on whether the two ships would collide. There were numerous factors affecting the decisions made by the captains that day, first among them the difference between the two ships, the fast liner and the aged cruiser. Butler writes that nobody knew at the time, but a situation was taking shape that was leading both the Queen Mary and the Curacao into danger. The cruiser could do a maximum of only 25 knots, but the liner's rate of advance was still an inexorable 26.5 knots. In four hours, Queen Mary would overtake Curacao, and Captain Bout would lack the information that would let him know exactly where the liner would be when that happened. Furthermore, Butler writes, the two commanders never conferred about their interpretation about the rules of the road. Butler explains that Illingworth assumed that because Queen Mary was the convoy and that the standard practice in the North Atlantic was to give the convoy right of way, that practice would be followed by Boutwood's escort squadron. But that practice was designed around Atlantic convoys, where the escort vessels were often twice as fast as the merchant vessels that they were escorting, very different than the situation between Queen Mary and Curacao. He explains, Boutwood, on the other hand, saw the situation in exactly opposite terms. The rules of the road were very specific about which ship had to give way when two were approaching one another or steering on parallel courses at different speeds. The faster ship always had to give way to the slower vessel, regardless of size or circumstance. Thus both captains believed that they had the right of way, each thinking the other ship was obliged to keep well clear of their own. It was a situation rife for disaster. A description of the accident in the December 1949 edition of the Navigation and Direction Bulletin notes that the senior first officer of the Queen Mary had noticed the vessels drawing too close and ordered the Mary hard a starboard. But he had been contradicted by Illingworth, who said, Carry on with the zigzag. These chaps are used to escorting. They will keep out of the way and won't interfere with you. 
But the bulletin goes on. Meanwhile, on the bridge of Kurosawa, a similar conviction that the other ship would give way had prevailed. So firm was this belief, in fact, that no attempt had been made to confirm which zigzag pattern Queen Mary was carrying out. Consequently, when at around 1409, the captain of the Curacao noticed Queen Mary had swung towards him, he and his officers considered it merely a yaw. Later, it became apparent that this was not so, and the captain took charge and ordered starboard 15 degrees. But unfortunately, at this moment, the ship was yawing and was 7 degrees to port of her course, and there was no evidence that the order ever had any effect. As far as is known, this was the last order given on Curacao. Shortly before 1412, Queen Mary struck the port side of Curacao, some 150 feet forward of her stern, at an angle of about 30 degrees. Butler writes that at 2.14 in the afternoon, the 81,000-ton Queen Mary would run down the 5,400-ton Curacao, knifing the cruiser in two and killing three-quarters of her crew. Johnson recalled that, and sure enough, the Queen Mary sliced the cruiser in two like a piece of butter, straight through the six-inch armored plating. Just as shocking was the fact that Queen Mary could do nothing for the men of the Curacao, Johnson explains, the Queen Mary just carried on going. It was the policy not to stop and pick up survivors, even if they were waving at you. It was too dangerous, as the threat of U-boats was always present. Belkowski writes that the witnesses were shaken. The worst part was simply sailing away and watching the cruiser go down. Several 29ers threw life preservers overboard, but the effort was futile. Ironically, most 29ers who were below decks at the time had no idea anything unusual had happened. Johnson had a similar thought. My mate and I wanted to do something. So after the collision, I said to my mate, come on, let's sling this over. And we released the cork life raft into the sea. Whether anyone from the cruiser managed to climb aboard the raft, I've no idea. Moreover, wartime secrecy meant that no information was released regarding the Queen Mary. Johnson writes that the Queen Mary continued her journey to Greenwich, dropped anchor and discharged the American soldiers. In her wake, a tragedy was unfolding behind her in the Atlantic. I estimated that about 600 men were aboard the cruiser, and I don't know if there were any survivors or not, as the collision was covered up and wasn't reported in the papers. Balkowski writes that the Queen Mary's captain called all the 29th Division officers to the main lounge and came right to the point. The officers and men were not to mention a word of this incident to anyone for the rest of the war. Johnson asked, I wonder what they told the families of the men on that cruiser. The convoy escorts were able to return to the scene of the accident hours later, where they rescued 101 men, including Captain Boutwit, but 337 officers and men of HMS Curacao perished in the accident. Two courts of inquiry later determined that the Royal Navy was largely to blame and exonerated the Cunard Line. The deaths of the men of HMS Curacao were indicative of the war more generally. Balkowski writes, It was an interesting way to be introduced to the nature of war. The men of the 29th had not yet seen a single German, and yet they had already learned a lesson. Their lives would be cheap in the years to come. Butler writes that how it happened is the sort of mystery that haunts ships at sea and causes captains to have nightmares. Both ships, officers, and crew did everything right. Both did everything wrong. It's almost as if the collision was preordained from the moment that Queen Mary and Curacao sighted each other. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.